We're live, Clive. Nice to meet you. John, how do? How do you do? Um, I don't even know where to start with this guy. So, um, first of all, I think it'd be a good place to start. Uh, me and John both did about a decade at Strange Ways. John did 75 to 85. 20 years after, um, I did 2005 to roughly 2.15. I think an interesting thing to mention was John's wage, 20 years apart, was the same as mine, starting salary, which shocked you. It did, yes. The guy's ex-military, um, joined the prison service. Uh, we've had a little chat before, I could chat all day to this guy, so... We're going to do it in small stages. We're going to start with uh, your military career. Right. Why you joined the military. And then start in prison service, Wormwood Scrubs, yeah? It was the Scrubs, yeah, in London West 12. Over oh. to you, Johnny boy. Right, OK. Well, thank you very much for asking me to do this little no. interview, Sam. Uh, I think it's important that people know what, what the prison service was like and what the problems are with the prison service because... The people who are in the prisons are you and I. Yep. They're but for fortune, and I have known people go into prison and, and come out completely changed. Yep. But you should be changed for the better, not for the worse. Yep. But listen, I'll tell you a little bit about how I managed to end up as a jailer, a screw. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in the 1960s, I was uh, working in the factories of uh, Lancashire, in the in the in the north of Lancashire, working in the weaving sheds and working in the spinning mills, and uh, I was earning. Uh, I tell you how much I was earning then. It was about twenty one, twenty two pounds a week uh, when I was seventeen, eighteen years of age. But uh, my parents were extremely strict and required me to hand over the entirety of my wages and gave me like thirty bob spending money. So I was basically a, sl a wage slave. So I thought, I'm not, I've had enough of this. I know it was their strange way of doing things, but I wasn't going to have that. So I thought, sod this, I'll join the army. So I went to join the army at the age of 18 and uh, I signed on to join the army and they said, yeah, fine, here's your papers. Get your parents to sign this and uh, then you can, uh, you can come in and you'll start your, your training. And so I went back with my papers to my parents. I said, I've decided to join the army. All I need you to do is sign the papers and uh, I'm off. I'll, I'll go and join the army. You know, I've got to do something constructive with my life because I'm working in an industry that's absolutely dying. The equipment that I'm working on was from the 1940s. I said, it isn't going anywhere. I said, so it's doomed and I'm not doomed. I'm going out living my life. No, no, you cannot join the army. And it was at the age when majority, the age of majority, was 21 and I was 18 so my parents refused to sign the papers for me to join the army so I asked the army they said no you if they don't sign then you can't go is that so, right that? yeah that's right you couldn't do it so you that. you could you not sign up yourself till you were 21 then you couldn't but I went to see them at uh, it was at Fountain Street in Manchester maybe the recruitment agency is still there and they said well there is one way that you can do it you can go before the magistrates and ask to be made a ward of the state. And then the magistrates will sign your your documents and you become a ward of the state. So yeah, let's do it. So they took me before this magistrate who had to make a statement why I wanted to join the army, you know, and get away from the factories, get a bit of a life, see the world. Yeah, okay. So they made me a ward of the state and the, and the magistrate signed as my uh, as the authority of the state. And uh, I was given a date to start the army. So I went back and told my parents. They went absolutely bloody wild. So, so I've, I've heard the term, obviously, what exactly is a ward of state? It do, means do... that they, they, are, they act uh, in loco parentis. They act as my, they have the authority as my guardian. How, how, how are they allowed to do that? So, so in effect, it takes... It takes away from your parents. Yeah, their authority. Is is there some sort of sort of principle like because they looked at what what you were wanting it for? Yeah. Um, 
why I wanted to join the army. I told them my parents didn't want me to join the army and they wouldn't sign. And they said, no, we think it's perfectly reasonable that at the age of 18, if you want to join the army, then they would do it. So they did it. And I went back and my parents didn't like it one little bit. So anyway, when I went to join the army, all I had was a bloody suitcase. And seriously, all I had, a, I don't know, no money, I had nothing. I had a, a trail warrant to Oswestry, where I started my training yep. in, the, in the Royal Artillery in May 1968. And I went down to Oswestry, joined the army, and uh, from there I went on to be uh, an NCO working in the military. I was promoted very quickly. That What's was an NCO, John? A non-commissioned officer. Right. I was working with uh, a, gun, a weapon called the Honest John, which was a nuclear bomb, believe it or not, yeah. which was launched by a rocket. It was a battlefield nuclear weapon. Wow. And this was in the 1960s. And every year, because it was an American weapon, the, the regiment had to have all the engineers, who were, the soldiers who were working on it, they had to take a, a competence exam with the American army. And it was a proper examination. It lasted about three hours. And you had to pass this to actually be allowed to work on the bomb because the damn thing, this would, this would blow a city up, you know? Was it a prototype or was no, it, it was actually a... an actual nuclear bomb? So, in this examination, I ain't got any money, as I told you, you know. So, I was sat in the barrack room and I thought I'd run out of books. I used to read a, an author called J.T. Edson, Dusty Fogg and Stories About Cowboys. I ran out of books. All I'd got was a drill book for the weapon. So, I thought, I know what I'll do. We've got an exam next week. I'll memorise the drill book. So, I got the drill book for the Honest John and memorised it. I can still, to this day, name the equipment. Sling H2416, you know, and all this. Anyway, I memorised it page by page like you would memorise a poem, you know. And when it came time for the exam, I never really thought too much about it. I sat down to the exam, and at the end of it, about a week later, I got a call from the sergeant major. He said, the Americans want to see you. I said, uh, what do they want to see me for, you know. So they took me over, and there was a captain or a major in the uh, American military, he said, uh, how did you do this? I, I said, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, how did you score 100% on this exam? He said, nobody's done that. He said, uh, is there some way that you've done it? I said, yeah, I memorised the drill book. He said, he said, I don't believe this. I said, have you got a copy of the drill book? So he, he had one on his desk. I said, well, go on then, ask me a question. He said, well, I wrote this drill book I wrote it. So I said, well, turn to any page. And he did it. And I got the matter. He said, how did you do it? I said, I memorised it like a poem, like anybody else would. Anyway, about two months later, they promoted me. And I became the NCO in charge of the actual unit that was operating the bomb. More respected than conscripted. Well, there weren't any conscripts when I went in. The conscription finished, I think it was 1961. And I joined in 1968. So, although there were people there who had been conscripted, yeah. generally speaking, uh, the, the, the soldiers that I were working with were all volunteers. So, shortly after me being promoted, uh, the NCO who was running the the prison inside, because every every regiment has got a glass house. I'd, I thought it was only glass house, which is a... Uh... Military prison in Shrewsbury, is there? Oh, no, they've, they've got a few of them up and down the company, but they have a regimental prison, you know, so say you're regularly late on parade, you get marched in front of the colonel and get sentenced to seven days. And it's just basically like going back to boot camp. Right, OK. But they have proper cells and they lock you into the cells. Really? Yeah, oh, proper cells, yeah. You know, all the, just like a prison. So I, at the age of, uh, I think I was 21, I was in charge of the regimental jail. And uh, the way I looked at it was, this had to be a joke. You know, the poor bastards who were locked in there. They hadn't done anything really bad. Late on parade, insulting an officer. I mean, goodness me, some of them bastards needed insulting. <laughs> <laughs> they did, you know, I mean, they were bloody Ruperts, weren't they? Yeah. So anyway, I used to say to the prisoners when they came in, listen, you're here for a week, two weeks, I'll play the part of being the bastard. I said, and you can be the nice prisoner. 
I said, and at the end of it, we'll have a cup of tea and forget all about this, because in years to come, this will be meaningless. So don't let it depress you. And remember, you're in charge of yourself, not me, and I won't hurt you. And I never would. So so what, what was what was a daily life when they were in prison then? Oh, it was just like being back to boot camp, you know, where they... Six o'clock in the morning, you get up scrubbing floors, scrubbing the floors, polishing everything, painting coal, painting grass. They had a in the in the regiment. They had a massive great pile of uh, rubble, and the what the what the punishment duty was. You had a uh, a wheelbarrow and a shovel. You filled the barrel up, took the pile of rubble from one side of the regiment to the other, stacked it up in a perfect pyramid. Then, when it had been inspected. You moved it again. It was non-stop. Was it just punitive, this? Punitive, yeah. Hard labour. Wow. And all you did this at the double. So I used to, I had no choice. But I said to them, this is a joke, you know. Let's play this game. Because we're playing a game. It's yeah, a game. Is. So I used to shout. I had to do it, you know. Get their knees up. Right, right. As loud as I possibly could. Echoed, rather. Of course, they loved it. The colonel loved it. All the officers loved it. Oh, if you're not a good boy, you know, you're going to end up being treated by this horrible NCO. I wasn't a horrible NCO at all. I was having a laugh. Tell <laughs> us about the... Uh... Oh, I used to do the boxing, yeah. It just came about that they had a boxing tournament in, in, the, in the army when I was there, and I, I entered. I thought, I can do this, you know. Cause I... Were you a scrapper when you were younger? Oh, yeah. I have got any choice. See, my dad was a policeman and I lived in a very rough area of Lancashire, the rough end of a town called Lee. And when I moved there, I couldn't understand what the people were saying because they spoke in a very strange uh, lanky twang, you know. So, and I didn't, I was uh, initially brought up in a place called Presswich, which was uh, our next door neighbor at the uh, franchise for the Ford dealership. When, oh, we yeah. lived, when we lived in Presswich. Was it a privilege? And Presswich they, is quite a... Yeah, they always spoke very politely. They're all members of the Jewish community. Yeah. And uh, so when I moved to Lee, I couldn't understand what they were saying because they were saying things to me like, no, that dust I want fate. Well, of course, I didn't understand that they were inviting me to do battle. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So I went on to my dad. I said, listen, no, we don't understand what they're saying. And they, they, they're picking on my brother, you know. They're picking on me and my brother. He said, well, there's only one way to do it. I thought my dad would go in and sort them out. I really did. No. But there was no cavalry. He just said, get back in there and sort them out yourself. So I went back in the uh, next day. And, uh, of course, they were still at it. So I gave them a good hiding. One at a time. Until... I'd, everybody in the school who needed to be beaten up had been beaten up and they left me alone. And they left my brother alone and I didn't want to do it. What, what do you think the, the psyche is? Uh, when I think at school, the lads who were hard lads who could fight, um, is there a psyche around it? Is it something natural or...? Oh, it's, it's natural. It's a, it's a given thing. I mean, you see, you can teach people to fight, but, I mean, listen, I, I'm... A, aficionado of boxing you watch Anthony Joshua he is a good boxer he's got size he's massive but he's not a killer he's not a natural is, is he is he like what I would call a coached athlete yeah, he's as a, opposed to sort of Tyson Fury who's more probably Ta Tyson Fury is a gypsy Tyson Fury won't stop until he you'd have to kill him so he's a scrapper you have you know listen in that uh, third fight with Deontay Wilder, yep. when you see Tyson Fury get hit as hard as, Tyson, as, as Deontay Wilder can hit him. Yep. And he doesn't go down. He headbutts Deontay Wilder. He gets hit at the side of the head. It's obviously shocked him, but his natural instinct is to kill. Yep. So he, he doesn't fall to the floor. He doesn't wobble. He headbutts. That's what you do. I mean, it's either in you or it isn't. And I don't think it's in. Anthony Joshua. It's certainly in a person like Roberto Duran. Yeah. It's, it's there, and you can see it in Roberto Duran, all his fights. You hurt him, he's going to come in and hurt you seriously. The same with Joe Frazier. I used to style my boxing on Joe Frazier. Just go in. My form of defence was here. Mm, hit me on the head. 
because it ain't going to hurt me. But when I get in close, because I'm not very big, you see, when I get in close, I'm definitely going to hurt you. <laughs> and so it did. So it's like a mentality and yeah, it's, it's, it's a mentality, natural talent. Yeah, yeah. So you did well in the army boxing? I did well in the army boxing, yeah, and uh, I was offered a contract. I was only 21. The guy, guy said to me, you know, as I'm setting up a team, he said, I would like you to, to come as a professional middleweight. But my wife, I was married at the time, said, are you not doing that? It definitely ain't doing that. She said, I want you to stop. And I did. I, I listened to her advice. I've been married 51 years, by the way. Still doesn't like the idea that I get in trouble. I, I was going to ask you because whether you were still sort of... Yeah, still married to the same lady. In fact, on our recent anniversary, she got a medal for bravery. <laughs> <laughs> she really did, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So I came to the end of my military career, but you know, I'm not going to stay in the military. I just did it to get away from the factories. Did you enjoy it? I was perfectly okay with the military, but my wife didn't like it. Okay. Is that is that just because it's it's like a sort of unsettled life or...? Uh, I really don't... She didn't fit in with the military at all, you know. We were all right when we were living. We lived with a German family for 18 months and uh, we were perfectly happy with that. In fact, when I was with the German family, the, the owner of the residence that we lived in was uh, a wrestler. And he introduced me to the wrestling team at a place called Paderborn. And uh, I was invited to join in. And I actually became the middleweight wrestling representative of the town of Paderborn. And they invited me to tour Europe with them. So I went to see the colonel in the army and said, listen, the German team have invited me to represent them as the middleweight wrestler. No, no, he said, you work on the Honest John. He said, that's what you're doing. You're not going to ask, but it's good at integration. You know, we're integrating with the Germans and put all the nonsense that's happened in the past behind us. This has got to be good publicity for the British Army. He said, you, you're back to your duties on the Honest John and uh, forget all about that. You're not going. So I couldn't go. Otherwise, I would have been to, I think they were going around uh, France and Belgium and uh, Denmark. And they were going on a big European tour, all the wrestling clubs, you know. So... Wrestling opportunities gone by the way, the, the actually coming out of the army was like you miss it and you're happy to go. You didn't, no regrets. I came out of the army because my dad became ill. My father developed leukemia at the oh. age of 44, and uh, I came out of the army because the family needed support, and yeah. I was the eldest boy. So I came out of the army to do what I could to help the family, you see, you yeah. know, help my mother settle back in because. Uh, obviously it's a great big wrench I mean this guy was like uh, he was the centre of the family you know and uh, so I came out of the army and helped my mother settle back in without her, without her husband you know Yeah. and when my dad had gone and uh, I, I got a job I was looking for a job I did some work as a head of security for a company they had about 15 stores all around uh, Britain and I used to go around the stores they were losing money from people pilfering and uh, it turned this is the early out, 70s? This is the early 70s. Was shoplifting yeah. big then? Eh? It wasn't shoplifting, this was theft by the managers. Oh, right. The managers were stealing from the shop. Okay. So they, they hired me to find out what, where all the stock was going because they didn't know where the stock was going. But I had an idea. And they had a great big warehouse and they were losing stock from the warehouse. So I set up a system whereby everything was checked in and everything was checked out. And we were still losing stock. So I thought, there must be something I don't know. So it just came to me. I got up about five o'clock one Sunday morning, went into the warehouse, I had the keys for everything, went into the warehouse, shut myself in the warehouse and sat down at the back. And I just sat there and waited. And it would be about half past nine in the morning when I heard something moving at the back of the warehouse. So I went quietly over and had a look. And what had happened was, the next door unit, because it was a big brick wall, they'd broken a hole through the wall and stuck a great big uh, unit in front of it. And what they were doing was coming through on the Sundays, moving that big chest of drawers or whatever it was, and coming through the hole in the wall, helping themselves to the stock in the warehouse, and then taking it back through. And this is the management? This wasn't the management, this was the people next door. All right. The company next door. So anyway, I managed to apprehend them, 
called the directors. The directors of the company came round. There were a couple of Jewish lads from Presswich, in matter of fact, uh, and uh, they came up and they called the police and they were arrested and uh, that's dissolved that. But there were various other outlets that were losing money. One, one outlet in Manchester, near, near the library in Manchester, called, it was a big supply shop, this old furniture and wallpaper and paint and stuff like that. So I did a test purchase. I got about 50 quid in five pound notes, marked all the notes with an initial in the top right hand corner, went in and said to the, it was a Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday morning rather, and I went in and I said to the manager of the shop, I said, uh, I need a hundred rolls of this paper. I'm doing up these flats, you know. I said, can we do a deal? You know, I'll pay you cash. Don't want no receipt, you know. All right. So, sold me the rolls, 50 quid or whatever it was, you know. Gave her the money. Took the rolls, put them in my car. Went round the corner. There was the director waiting for me. We went back in. And uh, I introduced myself formally there. I said, uh, my name's John Sutton, I'm the uh, security officer for this company and uh, we'd like to check your till. And the director was with me and there was no money in the till. The 50 quid was in her pocket. So that is why they were losing money. You were still a young lad then, did you do this off your own initiative? Yeah, there was nobody else. I was the head of security for the company, yeah. Oh. I, mean, I had to just work it out where it was going and how to do it, so that's yeah. what I did. Anyway, she ended up getting arrested and slowly I worked my way around all the units and completely no more theft. There were no one losing much theft. So then I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I saw an advertisement in, the, I think it was the Sunday Mirror. Seriously, and it, it was a picture of a bloke with a hat on and a grim face and it said, they call this man a thug, yeah? And it was an advertisement for the prison service. And I said to Mary, my wife, you know, I said, we've got to get a job here, a proper job, you know, not this messing about, you know. I said, I'll apply for the prison service. Cause I was going to go in the police. But I did the exam and all the rest of it, and I colourblind. When it came to the medical, I could not pass the medical because I'm colourblind. You see, you've got to be, you've got to be, you can't be colourblind to be a policeman. I don't know if that's still the case. I've had no idea. I wouldn't think things I like think that now have gone by the way, wouldn't you? They, they may have, yeah. I mean, they've got... I mean, when I was going to join the police, they didn't even have uh, female police officers. They had the women's police service. Yeah. You know, you could be a WPC. Or were they separate? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, I never realised that. It was only about 1971, 72 that they integrated. Right. But they were separate. It used to be the Women's Police Service. So when you see films from the 1950s, 1960s, yeah. you never see like a, 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 a female detective inspector or anything yeah. like that. This is very recent what we've had. Well, to me it is, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I decided to join the prison service. So I sent off the application form and they sent me something back. And it was quite elaborate, actually. You know, all this had to fill in why you wanted to join, examples of what you'd done, you know. So I wrote down about how I used to cajole the inmates in the prison and make sure that they were safe. And in the military prison? In the military prison and make sure they were safe and, and didn't look upon it as the end of their life because when you're locked in a cell like that and the jails and the prison cells are proper prison cells, you can lose, you can despair. But if you've just got an eye on it, I know it sounds daft, but to make sure that they were happy enough, I used to sing to them, you know. I mean, I'm not a very good singer, but George Formby stuff, you know, when I'm cleaning windows, just to have a laugh at night, you know. Make Is this sure. with the squaddies? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because the sol they're only soldiers, aren't they? It just is an unfortunate patch. And uh, so you get them through. And in fact, the uh, officer in charge of all that, all the lot of all that, he says to me, how come the prisoners are so quiet when you're in? I said, because I've explained to them, you get through this, you're out, and you're going to soldier on. You know, it's not the end of your life. Yeah. This is just a little bit. Anyway, so I wrote all that down, and they, I, you had to get a lot of references as well. I don't know if you probably still do. And I had a, a family friend who was a, he was a, I think he was a grand master of the Masons, you know, because a lot of Masons in, the, in that lot. And uh, he signed my references for me, and I was uh, called to go for interview at uh, Strangeways, 
and the interview room was on South Hall Street into the wall. If you go on South Hall Street in Manchester, yep. straight up, there's got the big old Victorian entrance, which is not used now. Yep. Straight past it on the left hand side, there's a door. You went through there, inside there, there was a set of offices, and that's where he did the exam. And the exam was really relatively simple to me. I mean, there were one of the questions I still remember, what would you not measure distance with? A ladder, uh, a rope, a chain, or an elastic band? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't have to be Einstein to work that one out. So there were silly questions like that, but it was tick questions and then you had to write a bit. Anyway, at the end of it, you submitted your papers and they were obviously marked by somebody who was dressed up in prison uniform with two pips on a principal officer, you know. And uh, at the end of it, it said, right, I want the following people to go into the next room. And it was, there were about six of us, I think, and we went into the next room. And w w I thought we, you didn't know, you see, but all the rest had failed. There was about 20 of us. Yep. So about 14 of them that took the test failed, and six of us left. And they said, right, okay, you've passed, you'll be called for a medical. Was that it? That was, that was, the, there wasn't anything else done on the day. No, no interview. interview? No, no, no. Just did the exam. You passed, we will call you for a medical. Yeah. And yet, then you had to go and see the board, you know. But, so I get this thing back. You go in, you have this medical, and uh, then you're fitted to go before the board. And you go before, I think it was three people, there was a, uh, Two governors and a chief officer. Explain uh, what a chief is. A chief officer, uh, there's basic grades in the prison service, when I joined anyway, in, in 1975. This, this, is, this is 1974, by the way. Yeah. But uh, there's basic grades. There's a prison officer. There's a senior officer who's got one pip, yeah. There's a principal officer who has two pips. There's a chief officer that's got a crown. There's a number one chief officer who's got a crown and a pit. It relates very similar to the police, yeah? Where you'd have like a, a police constable, a police sergeant, a police inspector, uh, and uh, then a superintendent and a chief superintendent. So that's the kind of... Is that, is that what it was laid out like? That's what it was yeah. like. It's very similar to the police. Or rather similar to the, to the military, because at the time... They seem to be to be recruiting people who were ex-military, and of course, when I went before the, the the selection board, they asked me to tell them a little bit about what I'd done. I, of course, I had a, the, the the military experience, and having been promoted to an MCO at quite a young age, and responsibility for running the prisons, I would be obviously ideal. So I I got appointed now to go for a medical. And uh, you just do a standard medical, make sure your eyesight's okay, you're not diabetic. You, you met, uh, they, at the time, they had the height requirements. You know, you had, to have, you had to be a certain height. You got to be relatively fit. You got to have certain chest expansions. And Anyway, past all that. And they said, right, okay, we'll send you a, a date to go to the training school. Uh, and they gave me an alternative. They said, oh, you can start on the 1st of January and do like three weeks or four weeks, whatever it is, before you go to the training school as a seconded to one of the offices in, in the prison. So I thought, well, I'll try that. What's so, that like, mentoring? Yeah, yeah, just in for a when I worked in the census office. Yeah. So I, I was in the census office for a month. And uh, following that, I was uh, sent away to... Uh, it was uh, the training school down south. It was near, I think it was it called Lay Hill or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the prison officers training school at Lay Hill near Bristol. And uh, yeah, I think it was three months the training course. And uh, each week, at the end of each week, you had a, an examination, you, had, you know, on, on what you'd learnt the week before. And... I mean, I wouldn't say I'm an academic genius, but it, it, I just got 100% all the way through. Are you studious? I wouldn't say you, I was, really. Think, I no. never really thought I was, you know, never really thought I was. But obviously I have a, an ability to retain 
information, I would say. Yeah, so I, had, I got that. I never really realised I got it until I did that thing in the army. Then I realised I got something. But anyway, I did that. So at the end of the course, uh, I, 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 I passed that and uh, they handed you a bit of paper and they told you where you were going and I was sent to Wormwood Scrubs. That's where I went from the training school at Lay Hill to Wormwood Scrubs. Was, that called, was it like national recruitment then? rather than local, so you it could go anywhere in the country? It wasn't local recruitment at all, no. it was national recruitment. And it was through the national press that they, they were placing advertisements. You said about about the advertisement, about something about a thug? Yeah, it had a picture of a guy with a stern image and a, a cap, you know, a, a military style, yeah. obviously a prison service cap. And it said on it, this they call this man a thug, you know. So really, I'll tell you a story about that later. But that's for a little bit down the road when I okay. was actually working with the recruitment for the prison service. Board. Okay. But at this point in time, I'm a brand new prison officer. I've just completed my training at uh, at Lay Hill. Funny story about Lay Hill. Uh, they had a prison officers club at Lay Hill. Now. Lay Hill is an open prison and the training unit was an old house at one side of it. There's a big farm, it was a farm, yeah? And they're working on that proper working farm and then they had the, the prison. prisoners working on the farm. Yeah, prisoners working on the farm, yeah. yeah. Part of Lay Hill, yeah, open farm. And uh, so one night, me and my buddy, who was an ex-policeman from Leeds, we went to the prison officers club at Lay Hill in, in the actual prison and uh, we had a few beers, you know, and I said, listen, I've had enough, I'm going back now. Because you had to walk right down the road, onto the main road, then back. It was about a mile or so, you know. He said, no, he said, I'm not doing that, I'm going to have another beer. He said, I'm going to cut back through the farm. I said, you can't be serious. I said, this time of night, it's dark. So I said, anyway, I'm leaving you to it. So I went off and I walked down the street and down the road and back to the quarters. Next morning, we had a parade every next, every morning. You lined up like soldiers on parade, and there's this terrible stench of pig muck. And the, the, the principal officer in charge of us said, uh, I want the person who was in the pigsty to step forward. And my mate came forward. What had happened was he got a few more beers down him, and the club cut back through the farm, tried to walk through the pigsty, fell in it, and he was covered in pig muck. <laughs> all over him <laughs> and it absolutely stunk the place out he got called up by the uh, principal of the training school and they said uh, have you got a drinking problem and he said i have yes i can't afford it <laughs> <laughs> he was all right he went to the scrubs with me as well so in uh, i think it was may 1975 i arrived at uh, hm prison wormwood scrubs did every prison have a club Every prison that I knew had a club, yes. A tell tell club. people what a club is, it's just a pub, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a, a social bar, you know, a working men's club, in effect. You've been at a working men's club, that's what they had outside every prison. In fact, at strange ways, it was inside the prison, inside the prison wall. What, what did you think to that, going into the job, that? You know, did, I, know, did, I, know did, I was accustomed did, to it because, I mean, the police had the same thing. And of course, with my brother being in the police and my dad being in the police, yeah. I'd been into these clubs. Yeah. So it didn't seem to me. Yep. I think I think people can understand, you know, um, social clubs sort of after hours, but these places were open during work hours, weren't they? Yeah. So you you on duty at Wormwood Scrubs, if you choose, could go in the club and have some beer and go back to work. All there were staff that did that. They'd go in the club and they'd have as many beers as they wanted. There was no restriction. I mean, you just had to pay for it. But it was a proper, you'd get proper beer, you know, alcohol, whiskey, whatever you wanted. And uh, then when you, when it was time to go back to work in the afternoon, you'd go back in. Did you ever do that? I, I did, yeah. I didn't think nothing about it. I mean, I wouldn't have a great deal. I would have a, a pint of beer and a, a pork pie or something like that. Good lad. Pot pie. That's all I know. You know, I didn't think a great deal about getting a lot of beer down. Just yeah. 
instead of having a, sh a shandy or a... Did people go back to work pissed? Some did, some were notorious drunks, yeah. Do you think that's the stress of their job? No, I think they were just piss artists. Really? <laughs> Going then back into the scrubs. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I arrived at the scrubs and of course they've got... I, honestly, I believe that it was going to be like the military where they had like barrack rooms, you know. I didn't know. So when we get to the scrubs, they had nowhere for us to stay. They gave us uh, an, an address, said we've, uh, you, it's a private address. These people taking like digs, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, so you, so you can. So you would like getting a room in someone's house or yeah, whatever? Yeah, a room in somebody's house. Yeah. And did they get paid for that? No, you paid them. Oh, right, okay. You paid them. So I went to this house, it was on Carlisle Avenue, uh, off, off, off the big dragon uh, near, near Wormwood Scrubs, it's London West 12, you know. I went knocked on the door and uh, this nice lady came and she would be about 75, 80, you know, she was old. And uh, she said, oh yeah, come on in. She said, uh, they sent you from Wormwood Scrubs, yeah, and new officer took me up and showed me this room, you know. Which was a nice little room at the front of the house. She yep. said, you, you, you were there, you know. Because she knew I wouldn't be there much because you just go to work and that's it. Yeah. You know, and her brother was there. He lived in the house. There was brother and sister lived in this little... It's like a, a, a two-bedroom terrace. Terrace, but a nice one with a bow front window. You know? And uh, I had a word with the brother who was 85, you know, and he'd been a train driver on the London Underground. Oh, yeah. Mm. They were nice people. And off I went to, in my uniform on the first day, went into Wormwood Scrubs. And uh, you do this uh, period of like, um, you know, where you go around every unit in the prison to uh, accustom you to the prison. So Was it like an induction or an something induction like that? An induction program, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you went to the works department, you went to the, uh, the hospital, you went to D Wing, A Wing, you know. And uh, the Scrubs is not like Strange Ways. Strange Ways is the panopticon. You know where they've got like a centre and all the wings are off, yeah. Yeah. But not at the scrubs. The, the the scrubs is built in a different way. All the wings are separate, yeah. And the only thing that adjoins them is a pathway through. So they're not. You can't stand in the middle of one of the scrubs and see what's going on. Right. There was A wing, B wing, C wing, and D wing was the lifers wing. So uh, that was. Did the first induction i went into the hospital it was a strange thing uh the first that the first week i was there introduction to the hospital and uh they, they said uh, i'll go and have a look at this unit and they had a unit in there and it was like a, a dentist chair you know i said oh what's this he said uh, we'll show you so this guy came out and i think he was a psychologist or something like that dressed up like a mad scientist you know uh, he said uh, oh yeah come in here i'll show you all this you know Sit down here. He said, we're doing experiments here. They were doing bloody experiments on the inmates. What, what do you mean experiments? Experiments. Have you ever seen a film called Clockwork Orange? I have, yeah. It's like that. They had, a, they had a like a screen, and on that screen they were projecting horrifying images, like of children being mutilated, people being set on fire, guns going off. And what they did was in this, in this chair, you were, you were wired up to like an electrical system where they put all these sensors on your head, yeah? And so they said, do you want to try it? I said, no. So they sat me in it, yeah? Why they took and started showing me all these things and they, they were reading your brain waves to see what the reaction was. And, wow. and uh, it was just like Clockwork Orange, except it didn't force your eyes open. So when they'd done it, about 15 minutes, you know, when they'd done it, he said, uh, this guy was really strange, you know, he, he said to me, do you realise, he said, you could be actively homosexual? I thought, I am getting out of this place. <laughs> You're bloody weirdos. Were you married at this point? I was I'd been married for a while, yeah. Yeah, been married for a while, yeah. I can, can you remember, you know, the atmosphere when you went in there? Was it negative? How did you feel? Did you feel prepared? Were you nervous? How were you treated by sort of the old staff? A lot of the staff, I mean, the older staff, they wouldn't speak to you. You know, you're new and you're a newly recruited inmate. You're the, in their eyes, the lowest of the low. You know, so they didn't speak. Just do this, do that. And you got, 
and once you'd got through the induction period I was sent to a wing called Sea Wing which was the biggest single prison wing in Europe. How, how many people did it hold up? It held about 500 people. Wow. It was just one wing. How many landings was it on? There were four landings. You ever seen a picture of the prisons? It's big landing, big floor landing. That was C1, yep. C2, C3, C4. C2, I was uh, put to work on C2, which was the biggest landing in Europe. They had over 200 inmates on one landing. How, how many staff would be on that landing? Five. There were five staff. There was one staff in the central office. He had a little office on, on the on the wing, yeah. on, on the landing, yeah. Yeah. And he did all the all the mail and all the rest of it, and took all the applications. Yeah. And, and four four other staff who would take a quarter each. Were the prisoners banged up all day then? Uh, there were workshops. They did they did work, and they had an exercise yard. And yeah. there were some interesting inmates. I mean, it was a cat A prison. Wormwood Scrubs, was, that's the highest security level. They have Cat D's, Cat C's, and uh, Cat B's, which is strange ways was a Cat A as well, wasn't it? it yeah, was a cat, high security. It was cat a Cat B A when out. I was at, at Strange Ways. But uh, Wormwood Scrubs was a Cat A prison, and they had a number of Category A inmates on there. In fact, one of the inmates on the landing when I was there was, uh, his name was Peter Cook. Peter Cook. He was otherwise known as the Cambridge Rapist. Right. If you ever heard of the Cambridge Rapist, he was a, a man who used to put a mask over himself with a zip, a leather he, leather mask over his head, and he'd jump out and rape all these uh, female students in the area around Cambridge University. And uh, he was imprisoned uh, on C2 landing. Really weird guy. He was only about five foot four. But he was built like a pit bull terrier. You know, he was strong man. Were, were the sex offenders not separate in a separate population then? Uh, they could be segregated, but he was a cat A. Right, so, yeah. He had to be yeah. where he was. And they didn't treat him adversely. I mean, he was a man who could defend himself. You know, so, I mean... Do you he, think he, if he hadn't been able to defend himself, do you think that was... Uh, to a certain extent, somebody would have got him, yeah. But he could defend himself. And because he was a cat A, he was under supervision all the time. Yeah. He was closely supervised. Yeah. I opened his cell one day and he came out in a dress. How he'd done this? What he'd done is he got his bed sheets and some ink or some paint and he painted a pattern on this dress. And he put this dress on. And all that's all he was wearing was this bed sheet, nothing underneath except a large erection. And he jumped out of his cell, dressed as a woman, grabbed hold of me and said, Mr. Sutton, I'm going to kiss you, I'm going to kiss you. Fuck, you're not going to kiss me, mate. <laughs> right in the head. <laughs> Straight back in the cell, shut the door. Eh? The Cambridge rapist tried to rape me. <laughs> wow. Oh, why he did that, I don't know. He was obviously mad, you know. He, in the end, he tried to uh, persuade the authorities to allow him to have a sex change operation. Back then? Yeah, that, that's it, but he didn't get anywhere with that. He died in prison anyway. Did he? Oh, yeah. So was he lifed off? He would Whole be. Whole of life? He would be, yeah. He, he never came out. The other guy, uh, interesting inmate on there, was called George Davis on C2. Uh, anybody who remembers the 1970s, there was a big campaign, Free George Davis, the Who, the lead singer of The Who, yeah, Roger Daltrey. I, I seem to remember. He, 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 had a, a, he wore a T-shirt, Free George Davis. Yeah. And George Davis was a, a an East End villain, a proper armed robber. Yeah. He, no messing about. And uh, he definitely said to him, I talked to him, he was a, a real character, you know, a, an affable East End kind of Cockney character. Yeah. And he was saying to me, he said, I haven't done this, they fitted me up. They got my blood and they smeared it on this. He said, I'm going to get out of here. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going back where I was doing before. He said, I didn't do that one. He said, I've done a lot of others, <laughs> which he had, because that was what he was. He was an did, armed robber. Did robot. he get out? Oh, yeah, he got he got it out on appeal, yeah. And but, did, did did he do his jail the easy way? Yeah, they loved him. Yeah? Oh, yeah. And as I say, I mean, I don't have a problem with inmates. 
you know, unless you try and rape me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm likely to object to that, you know. Yeah, definitely. But uh, no, I didn't have any problem with him, mate. I didn't have any problem with George Davis. Did you settle into the job easy, do you think? Right, the, right. Well, I, I think of someone I used to work with, right, who come from a very different background. He'd, he'd spent a lot of time all his life in the post office, like 25 years, retired, decided he were bored, wanted to become a prison officer. Now, he used to get slated by the staff. It probably took him, I think, two years to settle in, but he ended up being a very good officer. Mm -hmm. um, I work with people who've been in the job a couple of months, and if you didn't know, you think they've been there all their lives. Do you think it, it's just, you know, if you're a people person, you settle in because you'd had the military background or, what do you think not not makes a good officer but you know allows someone say to be comfortable in a couple of months where somebody else it can take years well you've got to be reasonably confident i think you've got to be reasonably, and you've got to be competent and you've got to have personal skills would you would you take personal skills into personal skills over brawn any day absolutely that's what's the key is i mean don't forget i'm not very big I didn't have any problem dealing with him. It's very, very rarely did I have to physically use strength. No, and I could do it as I did with the Cambridge rapist. But I mean, anybody who who, who was attacked like that would do that. Yeah, of course you would. You've got to do that. I mean, otherwise you're going to end up with this maniac, a naked rapist, and, and I, I don't really think that would be something I want to remember. No, but you obviously have. <laughs> Can I ask you? Because uh, I did. Did you work with people who really, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but should never been a prison officer, they're in the wrong job, but once they got in it, they'd take the salary and sort of take a, a back seat, be in the background, not get involved in anything, that sort of thing. Well, you see, the thing... But, mind I, you, um, a lot of military then. Yeah. So it's a different... Uh, the, the people who were ex-military, they didn't have any problem. They believed that when they gave you a direct order, that the inmate would do it. Of course, as the prison population changed... Yeah, explain what a direct order is for people. In, in, in the military, when you're an NCO, and, and say you're, you, so let's say you, you're watching this, you are a private soldier, yeah? You have no rank other than that being a, a, a private soldier. You could be a sapper, a gunner, or an infantryman. And I'm a non-commissioned officer, so I have authority and I say to you go and get yourself dressed you're on parade in the morning now you have got no choice you must obey that order otherwise you get off to the jailhouse you do what I say There's no choice and I had no problem in giving direct orders because I was benevolent I wouldn't bully anybody but if I had to do then I would rely upon my authority. And that's what you took into the prison service. When you gave a direct order to an inmate, go and get in your cell. And if they didn't do it, then you had to be prepared to actually get hands on them and take them to the cell, which uh, I did on one occasion. Now, this is very strange to tell this story, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I was put one day in charge of searching inmates prison cells. Now inmates from time to time will store illicit goods. You know, like they might have an unlicensed phone which they have phones in them days or well, tobacco. You'd be alright putting one of them phones up your backside. Yeah. You? <laughs> you get the Cambridge rapist to do that. He'd he'd help you. Yeah. So I was given the chance to, to, to search the cells on D Wing, which as I said before is the lifers wing. I was searching and given a cell by the security officer, the security principal officer, list of cells to search. Myself and another officer, we went to this cell and the guy wasn't in. The principal officer in charge of the wing said, uh, oh, he's in uh, his Spanish lessons or something like that. Yeah. He, said, he said, just leave him alone. He said, uh, go and have a coffee in the, in the canteen. You know, he said, I'll sign your paper that you've searched it. I said, can't be serious. I said, I've got to search this man's cell. I said, I'll go and get him. So I went to the... You're Spanish still young in service, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, I'm only done about three months at this time. 
So I went to the Spanish class, you know, where he was. They had private lessons, lessons in there, you know. Uh, and I called his name out. What do you want? I said, uh, you, you got a cell search. I have to search your cell. No, nah, I said, I'm not going to have a cell search. I said, no, this isn't a request. You are coming with me and I am going to search your cell. I'm not. You know, give me a load yep. of give me a load of verbal. Yep. Well, I've got an idea of what to do. Just walked in the classroom, snatched him by the head, arm up the back, out you come. We're going to search your cell. So I literally frog marched him from the Spanish classroom, yep. which was at the end of the wing, up onto D wing to his cell. And as I was getting him to his cell, about four or five officers come running up said, what you still get off him, get off him. I said, yeah, I'm going to search his cell. Oh, no, you're not. And the principal officer came up. He said, I've already told you, go to the canteen and get some coffee. Leave him alone. I said, I'm going to search his cell. I've got it here from the security officer. He said, you're not. He said, now, if you don't go out off my wing, he said, I'll have you thrown off. And these bloody four big officers coming at me. I said, all right. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a report into the security officer and tell him exactly what you said. That prisoner who I was about to search was a member of the IRA. Oh, yeah. The following week, he was on the roof with a big Irish trickler, dressed up. In the, uh, the scrubs. At the scrubs. Yeah. Went through the roof smashed the way through the roof. He was on the roof parading up and down with the Irish trickler demanding political status. Now, if I'd searched his cell, I would have found the flags, yep. the, the imitation military uniforms yep. that they were wearing. Why didn't they want me to search his cell? I believe that they knew that if I had searched his cell, there would be something in there. But I also believe so would that have been, are you thinking that would have been problematic for him? Oh yeah, that would have been, they would have kicked off. Because the IRA didn't mess about. My mate went into the IRA and they said to him, do you really want to be a dead hero? And I said, because if you don't piss off and leave us alone, that is what's going to happen. Some of these prisoners that, that you had then, and uh, I know they had a, quite a serious incident at Whitemore, didn't they? With sort of your, your terrorist type prisoners, your IRA, your mafia and things like that. Um, they have influence and power, don't they? And that's why people are fearful. Oh yeah, they know where you live. That That's what I mean, it's consequences, isn't it? They know where you live. Very, very dangerous thing being a prison officer. You've got to be aware of what you're doing. I was working, and I'd only been in the job about two or three months, and uh, the training officer, because every prison's got a training officer who's in charge of new staff, yeah. uh, called me and he said, I want you to see come, this man is with you for a week. And he was a, a newly recruited prison officer. Yeah. And I said, oh, nice to meet you. And he had been, this guy had been a senior non-commissioned officer in the Air Force. Yeah. He was like a, a warrant officer, grade one, the highest rank you can get. Yeah. And he just joined the prison service. So it was quite demeaning for him, who he was about 40 years old, yeah. to be with me, showing him round. And everywhere we went, he was making notes and doing this, and uh, as if he was examining in the place, you know? Yeah. So he was obviously going to, he, they had him marked, his card marked, as being a, a leader, you know, this man was going straight up the ladder. Yeah. And instantly he got a quarter, he got a quarter before I got a quarter, you know, somewhere to live with his family. But I didn't matter about that, it was just the way it worked. So I said to him, I said, you've got to be very careful. I said, because these people, if they get the chance, they're prisoners, so yep. they're human beings, but they will manipulate you. You know, they'll get you to do things that if you do do them, you, they're going to get yourself in serious hot water. He said, do you know who I am? I'm this, that, the other. I said, I've been dealing with men for the last 20 years. I'm the most senior. I said, I said you're working in a jail now. I said, a lot of these people have spent 20 years doing this, and they know, they psychologically know how to trick you. 
I know what I'm doing. So I never thought no more about it. I'd done my best to help him. Yep. Anyway, about six weeks later, I asked one of the, because he got posted to D-Wing. When it, when it was his permanent thing, he got posted to D-Wing. And uh, at D-Wing, they, 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 they said, that's what I was, how's he going on? He said, he's not in with us anymore. Within a matter of two weeks, the, the, the inmates on D-Wing had turned him. He was smuggling whiskey in, putting bets on in the bookies. Really? Smuggling tobacco in. They stopped him at the gate and searched him. And he was he had whiskey in his pocket and cigarettes and he was out of the job instantly. They didn't prosecute him. Why why do you think that is? Why why do you think he was so easily turned? Corruption's massive now, but why do you think, you know, someone who had been at quite high level, you know, in the Air Force or whatever, was changed so quickly? Well, I mean, you I don't know if you've worked with long termers, uh, but I worked with long termers for a while and they got people like Gordon Goody. And Jim Hussey, who were the uh, train robbers, they were on D Wing when yeah. I was working at the Scrubs. Yeah. <coughs> These w are experts. Were they well behaved lads? They ran the place. <coughs> Staff didn't run the place. They ran the place. Explain what that means to someone. The, the inmates, uh, the, uh, ostensibly, the prison officer are in charge. Yeah. They hold the keys. Yeah. But the, the, the inmates virtually do what they want to do. And if you try and interfere with them, they they bent somebody, probably the principal officer or the chief officer yeah. in charge of the of the unit. And if you don't comply, then they will make sure that your life is a misery or ridiculous. They'll do ridiculous things to, to you. To be fair, um, you'll know yourself if if you were, I don't know, if you wanted to be an ass with prisoners, or you were, like some people I work with, they would be fearful of repercussions on the out, wouldn't they? Like me, I, I bumped into a lot of people I used to lock up. I'm not in fear of of anyone, because I always treat people right, but there they can be consequences, can't they? Absolutely, and uh, as I said, the IRA used to know, they used to say, we know where you live. Can I ask you, why, why a security officer, why do you think he gave you that cell to search? And the other people were like, you know, a bit. I think it was a setup. Setting you up. Yeah. They knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And they needed a scapegoat. Now, when I went to search the cell, and the principal officer said to me, "Give me your book. I'll sign it. You yeah. search. You yeah. tell me you search yeah. his cell. Go and have a cat co coffee." So he would have then said, "As far as I knew." Right. I'm with you. And, and therefore, he didn't do it, did he? Did did at, at this point you, you're very young in the job? Are you? Did you ever think this job ain't for me, or or did it never enter your mind? Were you just sort of learning? Well, it made me very angry actually, because uh, one of the first things I wanted to do when I got to the World Cup was get my wife. From where quarters we to live yeah, with you. To live with me, yeah. And I believed it would be like the military, where they had quarters for you. Yeah. So I went to see the chairman of the POA, the Prison Officers Association, who was also the chairman of the housing committee, and said, look, I... I Explain this again. People, the, yeah. then, certainly back then, there was like, the, the prison system was like a big organisation, wasn't it? It was national. National and sort of within each prison, like Wormwood Scrubs, a committee who were prison officers, yeah, were right. in charge of the housing. They were, they were, it was the Prison Officers Association, they were in charge of allocating prison quarters. It was uh, at the instructions of the governor, he appointed the committee to allocate prison quarters to newly recruited staff or to staff so that they lived in, I mean, in London. Back in 1975, my entire wage from working at the Scrubs would not rent a single one-bedroom flat. I couldn't do that. Even back then? Back then. Couldn't do it. I went to see a, uh, one of these estate agents and said, I want to rent a flat, you know, do you have any? He said, uh, what, what do you do? I told him, he said, you won't have enough money to do that. You could probably rent a room, but imagine that, taking my wife. And living in a one room. 
And that was it. That's the entire wage gone. So what do you live on? You can't do it. So I went to see the PO. I said, look, it's not possible. I need to get uh, a quarter. And they said, well, there are no quarters available. I said, but we will advertise them when they become available. So what became available, I, had, I went in, I applied for it, didn't get it. So went on. I did about six months and I thought, oh, six months away from my wife. I'm not having this. So I went to see the principal officer of the, of the, of the union, the, the chairman of the Prison Officers Association, and said, who was the head of the housing committee. I said, what's going on here? He said, well, he said, uh, we haven't got any houses available. So I knew somebody who was in the works department and his dad was the chief officer in the works department. So I asked him to find out how many empty quarters they had. They had 20 empty prison quarters at the scrubs and they were not allocating them. So I thought, right, why are they not allocating them? So I went to see the Prison Officers Association chairman. And he said, well, we keep them back for senior staff who were coming in from other prisons like uh, Wandsworth or Pentonville or Brixton, and they get allocated them. So we always have a quarter ready for them if they get posted in. So as a prison officer, you're bottom at pecking order. So I was, I was their newly recruited staff. He said, you'll probably have to wait 12 to 18 months. I said, will I? I said, and that's your answer. This is the Prison Officers Association. My the union. union, this is the Prison my, Service Union. My union representative is telling me, as a member of the trade union, that I'm going to have to wait 18 months, separated 18 months from my wife. Come on. So I thought, right, I'm going to do something about this. So I got a big sheet of paper, put my name at the top, signed it, you know. Then I went round all the, all the junior staff who were waiting for quarters and got them to sign as well, put their name on. I went to see the governor and I said, I've come to see you about a quarter not to his door, come in. Uh, the chief officer, the number one chief officer was there and the governor sat at his desk. He said, yes, what do you want? I said, duh. I come to see you about prison quarters. He said, you've got to see the housing committee. I said, no, I've looked this up. The regulations state that it's the governor's duty. I said, you've allocated it to the housing unit, the housing committee. I said, but the housing committee is telling me that there's no quarters available. I'm telling you that there are 20 empty prison quarters and that the housing committee has decided on their own volition that they're not going to allocate them. I said, and I want a prison quarter. I said, and if I don't get a prison quarter at the next allocation the other, every month, I said, I will take all these people on this list here who have signed the petition demanding that you, as the governor, release these quarters. If I don't get a quarter, then I will take these people outside your jail with banners and demonstrate. I'll get the press, the TV. I said, and you can tell the country how you're holding these. Get out of my office. Get out. I said, I will. Anyway, next month I got a quarter. And the other officers who'd signed the petition, they didn't. When they came to see me, I said, Oh, what's going on? Why didn't we get a quarter? How do you do it? I said, What you do is you get some piece of paper, put your name on the top, get a lot of people to sign, you go and tell the governor, if you don't get a quarter, you can have a demonstration outside his prison. And they didn't do it, you know. I wonder why. Um, that's going to be a popular theme throughout <laughs> these conversations, isn't it? Get out of my office. Get out of my office. Yeah, right, frequently. You're yeah. in the prison quarters now, yeah? Um, the raised voices. I came home from work. I, I, what, I've, I've never seen prison quarters. Were, were these flats just full flats. of prison officers? They, 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 so, Basically, yeah, flats just prison staff lived there. That's where they lived. Right, so is that, was it like a compound or was it just? No, a... they, were, they were reasonably nice yeah. quarters, you know. There was three separate blocks with a walkway in between. Yeah, and I lived on the, the centre block. I think it was two one six Bromyard Avenue. You don't think you know, don't you? I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah I can't then. remember it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. I came home one evening from the scrubs. I've been working there on late. I've been about half past nine at night and I was always shouting and yelling. And I said to Mary, my wife, Mary, what's all this noise going on? 
She said, uh, have a look out the window. So there was a little balcony, so I went out. And down below there was about four young lads shouting abuse up at the women. I mean, they were shouting things like, your husband's on, he's gone away, we'll come up there and give you a service and all this, that. They're like, oh, my God. Very polite way of yeah. putting it, John. They were just being abusive, weren't they? Very it? abusive and nasty. So I said to me, I said, I'll be back in a minute. So I went down and I went over to them. I said, what are you doing here, lads? You know, well, seriously, what are you doing here? Don't live here. You know, you're just causing trouble. Ah, oh, you can piss off, you know, who do you think you're talking to? I said, listen, I live here. I said, and you're disrupting the peace and quiet of, of people who, live, who are living in this place. You don't live here. He said, ah, oh, piss off. He said, you know who my dad is? I said, well, I had a good idea who his dad was. I said, I have a good idea who your dad is and I'll be going to see him. He says, well, when you do go and see him, he'll tell you what you can do now. Piss off. So I thought, right, I'll go and see his father. And his father happened to be principal officer. Did you chairman. know him quite well? I didn't know him quite well. You knew who he were though. Who he, was. he was the chairman of the prison officers association. So I went to his house and knocked on the door and he said come in. What is it? I said I'm really concerned about what's happening in the prison quarters. I said and you're the chairman of the prison officers association and it's your son. He's coming round the houses shouting abuse at the occupants and generally making a nuisance of himself. I said, and if this continues, I said, there'll have to be something done about it. And he said to me, I mean, normally I, if it was me and it was my son, I'd say, I'll, I'll have a word with him. But no, he said, uh, in the event, he said, that you interfere or lay a hand on my son, he said, I will have you arrested. This is to me. I live there, he doesn't. So you try, you try and do the I right thing, aren't you? Try, what I thought was the right thing, you know man to man you know anyway his son was about 18 i think so time passes and uh one afternoon it was uh may 1976 it was the cup final the united were playing and i'd been on duty at the scrubs i came back with my friend paul and uh to my house he came back with me and we had a cup of tea and he said oh why don't we go for a beer my wife was heavily pregnant at the time. I said, yeah, we'll be all right. You know, we can go on. There's a pub round the corner called Askew Arms. It was about half a mile away. So me and Paul set off walking to the pub and the, this gang of, of youths followed us. And they were shouting abuse. You know, I thought, oh, just leave it alone. You know, I just, I'm not interested. Are you a patient man? Not really. Okay. <laughs> not really. Go on then. You know, I've got it in my mind, you know, I don't like this. Yeah. But I'm not going to go looking for trouble. If I can yeah. avoid it, then I will. Yeah. So I go to the pub and I'm standing at the bar having a, a beer with my mate. And this gang come in. All, I think there were three or four of them. And led by the son of the principal officer of the trade union. So he, he gets the glass in his hand and he comes across the bar to me and he says oh, I'm alright so this, I'm going to kill you yeah and there's three and they were about six foot two and I'm only about five foot seven uh, I thought well I have to defend myself you know I, I couldn't go I couldn't run back there was no wall behind me yeah you know there was no other way out I was in a corner so I just did what any reasonable person would do and defended myself the ambulance came and took him away and his other two friends were laid out on the floor beside him, but he ha happened to be injured. And uh, the police charged me with uh, assault occasioning actual bodily harm. But I told him, I said, what else could I do? See three or four big blokes come at you, threatening to kill you. Yep. I mean, kick him in head when they were down? I didn't kick him, no. I had only one. It Old took, school. Took me about two seconds. Once they were down, that's it. That's it. Just leave them to it. Yeah. And uh, eventually I got charged with that and uh, had to defend myself at Crown Court. Well, I was not guilty. It took the jury about 10 minutes to find me not guilty. How how did that go down at work? Uh, so there's a guy there, he's a principal officer, he's senior to you. Yeah. You've uh, knocked his son out. You know, was there a lot of animosity towards you? 
<laughs> what do you think? Yeah, obviously. Well, I, I do know. Yeah, throw a tea I mean, party for me, you know. But you're still quite young in service, aren't you? You're only at Scrubs for 18 months, so... Yeah. You've caused a bit of a fuss about getting some digs, somewhere to live, so you can bring your missus down. Yeah. You've uh, you've knocked the I Prince Loftus' son out and been to Crown Court. Yeah, um, not guilty. You got not guilty. Of course. You know, was it about this time you're thinking that maybe I need to go somewhere else or...? No, I thought I'll do my job here, you know. I mean, don't forget, I've got a wife, and I've a wife who's pregnant by yep. this time. Yeah. A very strange thing happened. I was on Sea, sea Wing, and it was a Saturday morning, and I was going down Sea Wing, and uh, I, I looked in a cell, and I saw this prisoner, a young lad, really, who was dressed up as a choir boy. So I went into his cell, shot the bolt, shot the bolt. The cell doors, if you don't shoot the bolt, they'll close behind you, you see. Yeah. So I shot the bolt on the cell, went in, I said to him, tell me, why you are dressed as a choir boy? So because you're not allowed to bring the out of the church. He said, "Well, I sing in the church choir." I said, "Sure you do." I said, "But the, that's where they stay." I said, "So why are you dressed up like this now?" And he started crying. This lad. I said, "Come on, what's the matter? He's only about twenty-two, you know. You, you looked at about fifteen actually." Yeah. I said, "What is the matter?" He said, "I can't tell you." I said, "Listen, sit down on the bed here and tell me what the problem is." He said, well, it's the vicar. I said, what do you mean it's the vicar? He said, I have to dress up like this. And on Saturday morning, when everybody's out on exercise, he comes round to the cell and no, I have to get down no, on my knees. No, 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 no. He was uh, performing fellatio upon the vicar. I said, no, really? I said, all right. Uh, so I got some, <coughs> wrote a statement out. Huh? Yeah. I said, it is that exactly what you want to say? He yeah. said, yes, yeah, signed it, yeah. yeah. Then I wrote my statement out, took all the, 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 the choir by outfit, put it into a pillowcase, took my statement to the principal officer in charge of the wing, yeah. said, I've got a report to make, and he read it. He said, one second, go and see the chief officer immediately. So I went in to see the number one chief officer at Wormwood Scrubs. I think his name was Green, actually. Great big giant of a man, a bit like you, you know, a big hefty fella. He's good looking as me, was he? That would be difficult, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, he was a great big giant of a yeah. man. He said, what, are you, what have you been doing, Mr. Sam? I said, I've got a report to make. I told him what I've discovered, you know. Just gave him my report, gave him the statement from the prisoner, gave him the choir boy's outfit, you know, the... Yeah smoke and all that. He said, and who has given you authority to investigate senior members of this establishment? I said, uh, it's the Queen actually. So I have got in my pocket a warrant from the Queen which gives me all the powers of a prison officer. Uh, as a prison officer, I have all the powers of a policeman, police constable while I'm on duty. I said, and it's my duty to protect the inmates and this inmate is being abused by one of the senior members of your staff. There is the report, there is the evidence. That's my duty, I've done my duty. So now it's up to you. Get out of my office. I mean, by this time I'm starting to think, are these people mad? I, 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 know, we're mad? I know we're smiling, but um, th thinking about it, it is horrendous that. And obviously people are complicit in these things, aren't they? Wow. It, you know, if you went sat with me now and, and somebody were telling me that, uh, you don't want to think of things about that. It is. That's what was happening. Listen, it, uh, just that, there was a Category A prisoner on C2 landing, and I was the officer in charge of C2 landing during lunchtime. So there's only one officer on yeah. C2 land and patrol. Everyone's locked up. Apparently. Everybody's locked up. He's a Category A prisoner. Yeah. yeah he's got a book and all that, you can't leave your cell, got to be in. Yeah. It would be about half past 12, 20 to 1, something like that. Everybody's off, there's only us there. And the governor in charge of Sea Wing came out of his office, came onto C2 landing, didn't have to say anything to me, went up to this inmate's cell, opened his cell up and took him out of his cell. 
Yeah. So I saw this happening and I went up and said, hey, excuse me, I said, you cannot take a Category A prisoner during lockdown. This this would still apply in modern day. Yeah. You know, these guys, you two can't. staff, su closely supervised all the yeah. time. Yeah. Extra, you it know. Just category, this was a Category A escape list prisoner. Right. Yeah, so he had yellow. Did yellow, they have that on then? Yellow, yellow and blue stripes? Yellow, yellow stripes, yeah. yeah. I said, you can't do this. He said, I'm the officer in charge of this. Uh, I'm the governor in charge of this wing. He said, get about your duties. I said, I will get about my duties. So I telephoned down to the senior officer on, the, on C1. Yeah. I said, this governor has just, he said, he's in charge, leave him to it. So I had reported it, yeah. So anyway, I thought nothing more about this other than the governor was an idiot yeah. for doing that because yeah. he was endangering not only him, he was endangering me. Yeah. Because this man, his name was Gus Smith. He was a, an armed robber serving 17 years. He was one of these, what you'd call a serious villain. Yeah. You know, a real, like you see on these rock and roll films with Guy Ritchie, he was one of them. A real dangerous man and the governor had taken him out into his office so I thought nothing more about it other than the governor's a loony you know and I'd reported it so I'd done my duty. So you did you cover yourself all the time don't you? Anyway weeks pass I'm in the census office yeah you know with the, all the mail that comes in yeah in those days everything that came in was read by the census officer blue pencil to sign it yeah yeah put back in the envelope and with the case of Category A prisoners, it was entered onto their mailing list. And still in my time. Yeah, entered onto the mailing list. And a prisoner cannot receive unsolicited mail. Correct. A prisoner can only receive a reply. So if a prisoner writes to you, you can reply. Because it's on their letter sheet, on their, on their uh, file. Got to be authorised, haven't they? Passed out, checked, yeah. police so, checks. Right. So I'm I'm in charge of the well, I work in the centre's office, and I happen to be working on the on the on the section that contained this particular inmate's files. So a letter came in addressed to him, and it was not just from anywhere. This was from the House of Lords, and it and it was a letter from some lords such as I forget the name. I don't usually forget, but I have. And it said, Dear Gus, how charming to hear from you. I trust that they are looking after you perfectly well in that establishment and I will definitely be down to see you. You know, it's been wonderful to hear from you again and I will make sure that everything we agreed is happening and signed it, you know, this Lord such a body. So I get his uh, letter file out. Hang on. He's never written to this man. There's no letter that's gone out to this man yep. for him to write back in. So how is he replying to a letter that hasn't been sent? Obviously, somebody is smuggling letters out for him. Who is doing it? Which is dangerous. Very dangerous. You don't know what's happening. They could be arranging for anything. Break out, yeah. anything. So, I, I know what to do. So I put the letter back, took this letter with me, and I went to see the inmate. And I opened, it, opened his door, his cat he had him back, loads of people about. I said, right, I said, who's smuggling your mail out? He said, I can't tell you that. I said, so he was honest then, yeah, in that yeah, as yeah. much well, as... He was a villain, he didn't yeah, care, you know what yeah. I mean? He was a big bastard, you know. Yeah. I said, you were going to tell me. I said, oh, are you going to tell the police? Because I didn't tell him, you know, I had no authority to really call the police. But yeah, I said, you're going to tell me, are you going to tell the police? So he said, uh, I can't tell you. He said, you're going to tell me, come on. He said, well, I'll, he said, do you really want to know? I said, tell me. He said, it's the governor. The number one? No, the, the, the governor the of the wing. wing. The, wing the, the wing governor is taking my mail out. I says, and why is he taking you to his cell, uh, out of your cell, into his office? He says, well, that, that's the agreement. I said, what do you mean the agreement? He said, he takes me to his office during the, hour, the lunch hours. Yeah. He said, and I have to give him one up the backside. No. That's what he told me, honestly. 
He said, I have to give him one up the backside. He said, and in return, he gives me whiskey and smuggles my mail out. I said, does he really? Right, I said, stay where you are, I'm locking you in. So I went away and I did what you do. I wrote a report, yeah. Had the letter from the House of Lords. Went in to see the principal officer, said, I'm about to report this. Oh my God. <laughs> Go and see the number one chief officer. So I went to see the number one chief officer. He said, oh, what do you want? I said, I've got a report to make. Gave him my report, which I'd written down, you know, as I, as I would do. I gave him the evidence, you know. I said, and it would appear that uh, he's seriously jeopardising the security of that wing. The, the governor of the wing is seriously doing this. And that he tells me that he's having relationships with him behind closed doors in the hours of lockdown at, at dinner time. He said, yeah get out of my office another one get out of my office you know so anyway I thought I've done my job I've done my job yeah I've done what I'm paid to do yep about a week passed I never see him that governor of sin again I never see him again but and, and he was supposed to be the wing governor you know I was on the landing on C2 landing and prisoners were coming up to me saying what have you been up to boss you call your boss gov, stuff like that, you know. I said, I haven't been doing anything, I've been doing my job. No, no, I just said, there's two police officers downstairs asking questions about you in the offices. I said, really, what are they asking? He said, they want to know what you're up to and this, that, and the other. The chief officer had taken action on my complaints, on my observations. Yeah. But he wasn't investigating the governor, he was investigating me. So he called the police in to interview inmates on my landing. Did, did you get questioned? I never got questioned. I never heard anything more about it. But I never saw that governor again. W were you thinking at this point that maybe he needs to go and work somewhere else? No, at this point I'm thinking somewhere but along... People are listening to yeah, this no, an, and... Thinking, don't get out, yeah, but I'm thinking somewhere along the line... I am going to deal with these bastards. That's what I'm thinking. A lot of people would have been out, mate, wouldn't they? Or... Anybody with any sense would... <laughs> yeah, anyone... Well, yeah, that's more like it. The, oh. the, the thing is, a lot a lot of people, uh, and it doesn't make them bad people, are fearful, and if, if somebody says, get out of my office, or somebody says, he's the governor, just leave it, a lot of people would just leave it, wouldn't they? I they think, would. I think they would, yeah, but I mean, in my opinion, I'd been given a job to do and I was going to do it. I wasn't going to be messed around by these idiots. And I thought they were stupid. And I'll tell you something, uh, shortly after all this would kick us, there's loads of other stuff as well. Uh, the chief officer and the principal officer in charge of the union called me into an office and both of them were big bastards. Saying it very big, and they, and they said, uh, You live in prison quarters, don't you? I said, Yeah, they said, Have you ever thought about what could happen to you and your wife? I, wow. said, I said, You too, disgusting bastard. I said, There's only two of you. I said, I'll tell you what, go and get another, another couple more. I said, Because you keep talking to me like that, you're definitely going to need some help. I, I know things have, have happened like this. I know people who worked in a job back in the day when you worked there. I know some of the things you have described, things like that did happen and worse. Um, it, it beggars belief, really, doesn't it? It does. Anyway, subsequently after uh, all this, I was attacked again by the same lad. Big fellow, you know, six foot two, you know, but he obviously thought... Oh, I just caught him a lucky punch, you know. So he thought he'd give me a... Is this the principal son? Principal officer's son, yeah. yeah. Thought he'd have another go, you see. So I came home one, one, one evening and he was laid across the stairs so I couldn't get get past because the staircase going up to the flat where I live. Yeah. I said, come on, shift. I said, I'm not climbing over you. You want to shift me? You'll... I said, oh, yeah. So I actually jumped over him and started to run up the stairs and he followed me he ran up the stairs and just before i got to my doorway where my flat was he caught up with me 
and grabbed hold of me. And what transpired then, you see it in Popeye and stuff like that. You know, when people go flying through the air. Yeah. That's what happened to him. I gave him the best hiding a boy's had in his whole life. Was the police in that? Oh, yeah. Police came, I called the police. My wife called the police. And they came and they took him away. They said they were going to arrest him and charge him with assault because he attacked me. I mean, he was outside where I lived, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, I can't go, any, can't go anywhere. And it's a one-way corridor. There's no end to it. Can, can I ask you? So all, all these things that happened, when you went home, did you keep them to yourself or... Did your missus know what was, you know, what your job involved and things like that? And was she concerned about you and herself, your family? She was concerned, but I mean, Mary wasn't particularly concerned about my capabilities to protect myself. No. It wasn't just that. I mean, I was up against the institution. Definitely. Because it wasn't just me. I wasn't facing an opponent, I was facing a, an institution that was going to grind me down. Subsequently, the police, I don't know why they didn't do this, because I went to see a police inspector. I said, listen, you've got to stop this. He said, uh, I've got an idea about you. Uh, he said, uh, don't you lay your hands on these people. I said, listen, I'm protecting my family. You know, and, and children were being molested by this gang. One, one of the prison officers had a boy about eight years old. He stole his bike, and when he went to get his bike back off them, they took all his clothes off him and pretended to sexually molest him. I don't know. This must have traumatised the boy. I went to see the guy's, the little boy's father, said, listen, you can help me. They've molested your son. Oh, no, he said, I can't do that. I've got to think about my promotion. I thought, are you out your head? Are you out of your mind? So, um, you're 18 months at the Scrubs then? Eventually I got uh, called up by uh, the regional director. This is the regional director the of the service. prison service to his office in Stag Place in London. That's the HQ of the prison service, or it was then. So I went in to see the regional director. I thought, I'll give this guy a piece of my mind. I'll tell him exactly what I think about his operation. I didn't get a chance. He said, uh, as soon as I walked in, see that map up there? There was a big map on the wall. It had all these flags on. You know, He said, uh, all those flags represent prisons. He said, uh, Mr Sutton, pick one. So I said, uh, strange ways. He said, you're never going back. To Wormwood Scrubs. He says, get yourself back to your quarters, pack up, you're going to Strange Ways Prison. Get out. And that was the end of that. Well, I'm very polite. You're given no choice. Nope. Back to sunny Manchester. Back to Strange Ways. I think that's a good place to finish. Do you? Well, well, it's obviously not <laughs> finished. It's a good place to start next time. Yeah. Um, so what do I think about this geezer? We had a good chat before. Uh, I could sit and talk to him all day. He's got a very good memory. Um, he's definitely someone who has uh, integrity. Um, certainly, I don't think a lot of people would have been able to sort of challenge the system. Uh like this man has. Um, I don't really know what to say other than that. But but I will say that people who work back in John's time, some really good people who've been in prison service a long time, you know, like I said, you know, 10 minutes ago, some, some have reported horrendous things that they've seen and, and I went off. Um, you can read my book. I wrote a book, Psychic Screw. It's on Amazon. Any links, anything like that, what I'll do, John, in the description. I'll put everything in the description. Um, what I'm going to try and do, guys, like John, I've said, this this part one, I will put links to any future uh, chats we have, which we will have. Um, 
Probably want to wait for the next few weeks if you're happy with that. <laughs> the way it's going, yeah. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you very Thank much you for your hospitality. I'll see you.